Hi everyone, welcome to The Weekend Out, episode 32. And today's episode should be relatively short. I just want to give an update, then maybe move on to one quick news story. So last night was pretty interesting. Around 10.45 p.m., I took part in what I guess you could call a roundtable discussion with three other podcasters, uh, all of us atheist or non-believers, and we held the, uh, the talk via Skype. There was me, of course. Um, there was Chris Weber of C Web Sunday School, and he was actually the host or the moderator. And then there was someone um, as strange as it sounds who prefers to go by either the name Dumbass or alternately Parrot. Uh, <laughs> But don't let those um, monikers fool you. He is a actually a pretty bright guy, as um, all of the other participants were. And then also there was Steve, who is one of the hosts from the A Matter of Doubt podcast. And I believe dumbass, <laughs> it's going to take getting used to uh, referring to someone that way. But I believe dumbass hosts a multitude of podcasts. Uh, one of them, I believe, is the Invisible Sky Monster podcast. I believe another one is Dumbass's Guide to Knowledge. So if you're still jonesing for a skeptical fix after listening to The Week in Doubt, you can go to iTunes and check out what some of those guys have to offer. And the discussion primarily focused on questions regarding whether or not it's all right to criticize religion and how does freedom of speech apply to uh, the criticism of religion? The roundtable discussion was Chris Weber's idea, and I think he was at least partly motivated to want to cover this topic by all the recent news stories surrounding that controversial YouTube film, The Innocence of Muslims, and whether or not it was responsible in part for the embassy attacks throughout the Muslim world, as well as all the protests and uh, riots. So we had a pretty stimulating conversation about just how far should freedom of speech go when it comes to the criticism of religion, and do people like the makers of that controversial film or the people behind the Danish cartoons have any responsibility to bear at all if people react violently to their art or their speech? I think one thing we agreed on that I kind of broached was when approaching the question of whether or not it's all right to criticize religion, that there's two things we should take into consideration. One is how legally free should we be to criticize religion? And then where do we want to draw the line for ourselves ethically? How far do we want to let ourselves go when criticizing someone else's faith? And I basically said that the latter, uh, how far we want to go ethically, that's something each one of us has to decide for his or her self. I talked about how I kind of resent things like those uh, billboards and posters that maybe more militant atheists put out around the holidays saying things like, there is no God, so be good for goodness sake. Well, although I believe in the sentiment, I don't think that believers uh, should necessarily have to look at that during one of their holiest times of year. Not that it should be illegal, but I just find it personally in bad taste. So I think each one of us has to decide. Uh, where we want to draw the line in that regard. But legally speaking, I believe we should be free to criticize religion as we would any other topic within the boundaries of the First Amendment. Even though it was a real-time conversation between all of us, Chris had each one of us only record our own voices, so we wore headphones to block out any other noise and just each recorded um, our own mic input. Then Chris is going to take uh, each one of our recordings and try to put together the best 
uh, possible version of the discussion. And I think he said it, it should be available on iTunes as an episode of C-Web Sunday School anywhere from a week to two weeks from now. I was going to take my recording of myself and try to somehow cobble that into today's episode and make commentary on it, but I thought it might seem a little disjointed or boring if it's just uh, my part of a four-way conversation with the other three participants' uh, voices missing. But I'll definitely keep you updated on uh, when that episode will hit iTunes. I'm just looking for a quick little news story I can do to fill some time. Uh, this one I could probably actually do a whole show on, but I'll try and make it quick anyway. I don't know if uh, you're aware that in recent news, maybe uh, roughly about two weeks ago or something like that, or within the last two weeks, a old scrap of papyrus turned up that seemed to insinuate that Jesus may have been married uh, because he refers, well, according to this article, to uh, Mary, must be uh, Mary Magdalene, I would imagine, uh, that uh, he refers to her as his wife. But now there's some doubts surrounding the authenticity of the fragment. And here's a uh, article from the Huffington Post Religion uh, dated September 27th entitled, Vatican paper says Jesus' wife scrap is fake. I'll, just, I'll read a uh, few paragraphs from the article. Vatican City. The Vatican newspaper has added to the doubts surrounding Harvard University's claim that a 4th century Coptic papyrus fragment showed that some early Christians believed that Jesus was married, declaring it a fake. The newspaper, La Osser of... Uh, wow... La Osservatore Romano, I'm uh, mostly of Italian ancestry, but I don't speak Italian, so I probably just butchered that supremely, but anyway, uh, published an article Thursday by leading Coptic scholar Alberto Compliani and an accompanying editorial by the newspaper's editor Giovanni Maria Vian, an expert in early Christianity. Both cited concerns expressed by other scholars about the fragment's authenticity and the fact that it was purchased on the market without a known archaeological provenance. At any rate, a fake, Vian entitled his editorial, which criticized Harvard for creating a clamorous media frenzy over the fragment by handing the scoop to two U.S. newspapers, only to see specialists immediately question it. Karen King, a professor of early Christianity at Harvard Divinity School, announced the finding last week at International Congress on Coptic Studies in Rome. The text written in Coptic and probably translated from a second century Greek text contains a dialogue in which Jesus refers to my wife, whom he identifies as Mary. The issue has had resonance since Christian tradition has long held that Jesus was unmarried, and any evidence to the contrary would fuel current debates about celibacy for priests and the role of women in the church. Now, skip down a bit. King has said that the fragment doesn't prove Jesus was married, only that some early Christians thought he was. She acknowledged the doubts raised by her colleagues and says the fragment's ink will be tested to help determine when it was written. Some scholars attending the conference questioned the authenticity of the fragment, noting its form and grammar looked unconvincing and suspicious. Others said it was impossible to deduce the meaning of it given the fragmented nature of the script. Um, so I don't really know what to make of this one. Uh, I could actually see it either being um, authentic or not. And I've heard warring ideas about uh, whether or not Jesus would have been married. On the one hand, I've heard scholars say that since in Judaism, especially ancient Judaism, uh, in the ancient Judaic culture, it was expected that a young man would be married at a relatively early age. And if he hadn't gotten married, he um, could be expected to be treated with scorn or ridicule. But conversely, uh, supposedly there were Jewish ascetics who 
engaged in celibacy. I think even uh, members of the Essenes, the Dead Sea community, were celibate. I think whether or not the Essenes were actually celibate is a matter of some contention. But uh, there are some well-known classical writers uh, or historians who do refer to them uh, as being celibate. Pliny the Elder says uh, the tribe of the Essenes that it has no women and has renounced all sexual desire. And then uh, the Greco-Jewish uh, historian Philo of Alexandria says, furthermore, they abstain from marriage because they plainly perceive it to be only or the primary danger to the maintenance of the communal life, as well as because they especially practice continence. For no Essene takes a wife because a wife is a selfish creature addicted to jealousy and skilled at beguiling the morals of her husband and seducing him by her continued deceptions. Um, well, I guess I'll try to ignore the apparent misogyny for now in that one. Um, but I'm not saying that Jesus was a member of the Essenes or the Dead Sea community, but I believe there are some theories that he may have been influenced by them. Um, but I think what it goes to show, though, is that um, contrary to what some scholars uh, like to say, th there may have, in fact, been um, celibate ascetics in the, the ancient Jewish world. But like I said before, also it's said that um, Conventionally speaking, Jewish males were expected to be married uh, at a relatively early age, and if they weren't, they could be scorned. So I think uh, the argument could go either way. I guess we'll have to wait for the testing results. If we see those in the news, I'll be sure to update you. Uh, we're about at the 13-minute mark, and as I suggested at the beginning of the show, this would most likely be a short episode uh, so I will call it quits. And as always, you can like The Weekend Out on Facebook. You can subscribe through iTunes, uh, rate us through iTunes, um, rate the show through Podbean, subscribe through Podbean. If you want to get in touch with me, you can leave a message on the Facebook page or message me through Podbean. Uh, any support is always appreciated. Thank you.